um, to this event. Um, how many of you were at After Tiller? Most of you. Okay, great. Really fortunate today to have the filmmakers with us and a panel whoops, um, to talk about the movie. And so I just want to introduce the panel and then Michelle Trupiano, who is um, works for Planned Parenthood, and she's going to be moderating the panel. So we have Lana Wilson and Martha uh, Shaw, Shane, um, our fabulous filmmakers. I'm just really awed, and we'll you know talk to you more about it. But it was just a really you did a fabulous job on this film. Um, so congratulations, and I hope that you had fun at the festival. Yes, uh, we did. Phil Woods, who's a professor at uh, in the University of Missouri uh, Department of Psychological Sciences. And he's here to talk about his own family's personal experience with Dr. Tiller. Um, Reverend Nancy Tanner Thies, um, and then Michelle Tribiano from Planned Parenthood. So I'm just going to turn it over to Michelle and the panel. And can everyone talk into the mic? Oh, okay. You're, you're... Yeah, it'll just be better. Okay. So um, you, want to... you might want to okay. just take it off and pass it around. And it's on the bottom. And can everybody see the panel? Do you want them to stand up when they're talking? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Michelle, for a great job. And uh, thanks, Marjorie. Can you hear me? No, she doesn't. Okay. 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 Hello. Okay, we're going to go without the mic then, uh, which I think is good. we'll find. Um, so thank you everyone for coming, and this is co-sponsored by um, several different groups. Um, so by the MU School of Social Work, by Planned Parenthood, by the Feminist Student Union, by Law Students for Reproductive Justice, and by the National Organization for Women. So I want to thank everyone. I know that people were sending out information, so thank you everyone for doing that. Um, so we're so excited that the filmmakers agreed to stay uh, another day um, just to be able to, to talk more intimately um, with those of, of you who are interested in hearing more about the movie and sort of their experiences. And so this is just going to be a pretty free-flowing um, Q&A. We're just going to um, begin it with a, a little bit of introduction about the movie. You guys, uh, most of you have obviously saw it, but some people didn't. So we're going to do, they're going to do a little bit of introduction. We're going to watch uh, the trailer and one scene from the movie just to get everyone in the frame of mind of you know what either they saw over the weekend or to give people a little bit of reference if they were not able to see the movie and um, just to get people in the right space um, and then we'll go down the panel and then we're really going to spend the majority of the time in questions and answers um, Q&A so we'll just sort of free flow um, you can ask questions of anyone on the panel but it's sort of your time to, to ask anything that either didn't get the question answer session after the movies are so short um, and so I'm sure people have a lot more questions um, that they would like to answer um, so, or get answered. So that is what we're going to do today. So I'm just going to turn it over to Lana and Martha just to do a quick introduction about the movie and um, your experience with it. And cool. then uh, we'll view the clips. Thank you. I'm going to stand. I just feel a bit more lively when I'm standing up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because you're out all night. <laughs> was not, of course, I wouldn't be out all night before an important discussion. Like this. I don't do that. So. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, just to talk, I guess, a bit just about the genesis of the movie. Uh, the idea came from watching the news coverage around Dr. Tilly's death, which I'm sure many of you saw as well. And it was just a bit frustrating to watch the news always say, a controversial doctor's been killed, and then get a talking point on each side of the issue, and that was kind of the extent to which they covered it. So it was just feeling like they weren't uh, even going into the most basic biographical details about this man. And I was just so curious about why someone would risk their life every day uh, and be under such pressure, be a villain for much of the country and do this work regardless of that. He was sh shot in both arms in the 90s and actually went back to work the next day. You know, what kind of person would do that? What personality would it take? What was driving him? Just really curious about who he was and why he was doing this. I first thought, well, someone should make a documentary about Dr. Tiller, about where he was coming from. And I thought, no, actually, wouldn't it be interesting to go inside the present day lives of the doctors who are left now? Is there anyone left? and what are their lives like is the focal point of so much anti-abortion anger. Like, so that's why uh, we decided to take a present day fly on the wall and kind of look at these four doctors who were left after Dr. Tiller. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we probably had a lot of the same questions going into it. I mean, I think one of the reasons why 
I wanted to make the film was just sort of like, how in the world could, you know, in a country of this size, how could there be only four doctors who are openly performing this procedure? It seems almost impossible. Um, and so wanting to understand, yeah, like what are the pressures and the challenges on them? Why aren't there more people who are, who are doing this work? Um, and also just wanting to take the, you know, the film, for those of you who've seen it, it's like fairly sort of understated, the tone is pretty quiet, and I think wanting to sort of take the conversation about abortion in that direction a little bit more. So, um, yeah, so that's how we can look at Yeah, and I mean, I think our big goal is just to show that this is a lot more complicated than anyone thinks it is, and it's, it's not black and white, it's very gray, and it's not about judging people, it's about having compassion for them. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just show the clip and then we'll talk more. George Tiller was a target of anti-abortion extremists. His Wichita clinic was bombed in 1985, and then, at the age of 67, he was murdered at church. The death of Dr. Tiller leaves only four doctors in the country who are able to perform late-term abortions. The day that Dr. Tiller was murdered, there were just no other thoughts in my mind but to carry on the mission. What drives women to seek a third trimester abortion? Most people understand what's going on for the woman. It's impossible to support it. Because it's guilt no matter which way you go. Guilt if you go ahead and do what we're doing, or bring him into this world and then he doesn't have any quality of life. I mean, I said, look, of course you don't want an abortion. Nobody wants an abortion. She has a disease called arthrogryposis, where she can't bend at her joints. She wouldn't be able to walk. He could be a stillborn. He would have a very short-term life. What's the right thing to do? What's really helping people? What life will this baby have? What really got me interested was when they started shooting doctors. And I thought, everybody's going to get scared out of doing it, and then who's going to do it? I had five shots fired through the front windows of my office. Many, many times I felt so alone. How many times did you receive threatening phone calls because of what I did? Well, people call and I just hang out. When I walk out the door, I expect to be assassinated. Late term abortion, so this is where everybody draws the line. The Republican Party said that was an abomination and should be driven from the state. I immediately started getting death threats in the middle of the night. You don't give in to terrorists because it only gets worse. If I just give up and stop doing anything after 20 weeks, some of them may get desperate and do things on their own. There's something that needs to be done. Leroy Carhart, the most infamous late-term abortion provider, has come to open his business here. We have been at war. If we don't fight back, it'll go away. The abortion will not be at war. I just thought the other day, I can't be tired, my God. <laughs> there aren't enough of us. I want to show one more clip um, from a scene from the movie of a counseling session. <clears throat>
versus a corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. so obviously, if the baby didn't get part of his brain, what what outcome of that can possibly be good? And why is there still guilt? Because it's guilt no matter which way you go. Guilt if you go ahead and do what we're doing, or bring him into this world and then he just didn't have any quality of life. So I think we're just going to start with a couple questions to you guys, um, and I'll just I'll just kick it off with a couple mm -hmm. questions, and then we're going to actually hear from from Phil and um, Reverend. Um, Please just Nancy. Nancy. Then ta Nancy, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then really open it up because I think those of you in the audience um, probably have a lot of questions and just um, engage in that dialogue. But um, so we've heard about sort of why you guys you know decided to to make the movie, um, but in what ways were you surprised by um, by sort of what you encountered along the way? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good for you to stay and say whatever makes more okay. sense to uh -huh. you. Yeah, I think we were uh, surprised. I think we learned a lot about uh, where these women were coming from that surprised us. And you know, personally, I think I tended to actually be a kind of judgmental at the beginning of the process. I'd hear a story, it wouldn't totally make sense to me, and I'd be like, I don't understand, you know, what pushed this woman to wait for this long to get an abortion, or blah, blah, blah. And then gradually, the more women we met, the more we realized what kind of circumstance they're coming out of, things that are really surprising, you would have no idea about. They were, you know, had no money, had several kids, had to get time on board, had to get childcare, had to raise the money for the abortion, you know coming from very desperate, challenging circumstances uh, that are just hard to understand. But the more I met them, the more I realized, you know, oh my god, I have really no idea the places these women are coming from and how much harder their lives are than mine. So uh, I think I just learned to be, you know, a bit less judgmental, more compassionate, really think you can understand where anyone else is coming from. Even one patient I remember who learned that uh, she'd actually been raped before and had, had the baby. She had had a baby that she'd given up for adoption. Well, wow. so realizing that some people have been through all of this, mm -hmm. and I mean, just you're saying that women are the best people to know what's the right choice for them. So, right, right. Who said that in the movie? <laughs> One of the doctors said, Dr. you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, to us, when we started making the film, it, it seems like very self-evident that, like, these people must you know, they have incredible courage to keep doing this and despite the dangers and that they must see themselves that way. But I think what was really surprising in some ways was that that's not necessarily how they see themselves. I think they see themselves certainly as, as being like very stubborn people, but mostly they're just, just have this intense focus on their patients and on doing whatever they need to do to support their patients. So for them, it's really not about like, you know, about courage, it's about love and compassion for the patients, and I think that was really interesting. I think another interesting thing that, um, you know, we learned through talking to a lot of the patients was just the complexity of um, their decisions regarding adoption. I mean, that's like one of the first questions that, you know, if it's a maternal education patient, that the last one they call, have you considered adoption, and sort of the reasons why some women don't feel like that's an option for them. I think that that was one of the really interesting things um, to discover as well, and one of the most sort of complex um, issues that we we explored with it. So yeah, and another surprising thing—it might seem obvious, but to us, uh, just wasn't that you know these doctors don't go into this work to be political figures. You know, they see themselves as doctors; they're helping their patients, and then they're unexpectedly in the midst of this enormous political firestorm. And that the doctors struggle with this work. We're lucky that they're so articulate and candid in the film about their own struggles with the work itself. But uh, it, it kind of surprised I me. Mean, it seems obvious, but it's like, of course, yeah, they're just doctors. You know, Dr. Tiller's daughter saw the movie and really liked it and said to me afterwards, if my dad was alive, he would have said, I mean, I still don't understand what is all the fuss about me. And it's like, <laughs> and it's like yeah, you know, it's to have that perspective. Right. So this is, how did you get the doctors to let you in? Um, you know, that they are so under attack all the time and obviously sort of private and Dr. Tiller was a little bit of the face. Um, and so how did, I mean, you talked a little bit about last night that it was a process, you know, but um, 
they were so open and honest yeah. um, on on film. You know how how did that process look like? Yeah, um, we well we, when we started making film in early twenty ten, start of twenty ten, I think we the men agreed pretty quickly. Dr. Card, as you can tell from the film, is just so easygoing, doesn't notice a camera around him ever. He just you know. So uh, he was immediately on board. He's just such a sweet, easygoing guy. Dr. Hearn was interested, but he was like, you know, this isn't going to change anything. He's been doing this work. I think he's been filmed since 1970. So he's like, it's not going to change anything. I don't know. You know, it's just not worth your time. We're, he thinks that well, we're sort of be overturned any minute now. Is just is pretty pessimistic about the state of things. But when we met him in person, he, he agreed to do it. And then uh, the two female doctors took about a year to persuade to be in the movie because they were very close to Dr. Tiller, who did not do press interviews. Again, just feeling like it's not about him; it's about the patients. Why should he be a part of this? And I think that with some some distance from his death, we just started to think, you know, yeah, it shouldn't be about them. But the anti-abortion movement has made it very much about the doctors. <laughs> And if there's no one telling their story, if they're not putting a human face on who these doctors are and explaining their motivations, then it's just going to be a vacuum of information that will be filled in by anti-abortion propaganda or whatever. So I think they realized that telling their stories could only help them. And also getting the stories of the patients into the film was very important to them. And they also did an interview on the Rachel Maddow show, their first interview. And they didn't have an upsurge in, in threats or harassment after that, so I think they felt a bit more comfortable being public. And uh, they also thought, you know, we need female doctors' perspectives in here. They didn't want to just be, you know, you know, worse patients than male doctors. Right. So I think that was important to them too. Um, I think we're going to just go ahead and we'll move over to Phil. Um, Phil's going to share a little bit about his personal experience um, with abortion care at Dr. With, from Dr. Tiller um, and how the movie, you know, what what the movie meant to you, what, you know, what your experience was with the movie. I think it's a little easier for me if I stand up because I tend to look down at the floor. <laughs> um, well, this is an easy room to, to talk to. I mean, some of you I've had in classes and some of you so. um, I always, you know, I, I have testified at the Missouri Senate Committee on Health uh, before, and actually that's a little easier than it is to talk to you folks here, because I'm kind of aware that I'm really here by coincidence, by chance. So let me tell you a little bit about that context. Uh, I have a daughter who is a very wonderful young lady at the University of Minnesota now, and uh, shortly after you know, she started kindergarten, we tried to have another kid. And uh, things were not successful, and long story short, we started to use fertility treatments, and we escalated through those over the course of time, and finally did a, what's called a gift procedure, where they stimulate lots of eggs, and then they fertilize them and re-implant them. And we were really happy, and we got told, oh, it's not only are you pregnant, but it's twins. And the pregnancy was going along fine, and we were doing all the organic food and all the crazy things people do, you know, when you're pregnant, you want to have all the, all the right food. And went in at 13 weeks for an, for an amniocentesis, just to make sure things were okay in the standard ultrasound. At which point, the physician said, a little bit of a problem here. The, the amniotic uh, fluid for one twin is a bit larger than the other one. We recommend here is amnio drainage sort of. Well, sorry, wait a minute. First, we did watchful waiting. We'll see if the situation resolves because it often resolves. And then the next time, kind of worse, let's do amnio drainage and reduce the fluid and then watch, see what happens. And uh, a couple more weeks pass, and the doctor says, well, you know, it's not resolving, and we need to schedule a really high resolution ultrasound. She was going on here. It takes a while to schedule that. The reason I'm telling you this is, it's not the case that all of a sudden, when you have a problem, they just say, oh, fetal anomaly, let's go and get this taken care of right away. It evolves throughout the weeks, and you have incomplete information, and you kind of run through a whole bunch of treatment options. Uh, 
few more annual drainages later, which are not easy things to do uh, or watch. Um, they said, well, you know, there are, there, there are problems. They're starting out with one of the twins. Long story short, blood is going out from one twin, and it's not coming back to that twin. So one twin is getting way too much blood, and the other one isn't getting enough. And this is not happy news for the one that's getting too much blood. The fetal blood is very thick, so the heart is getting really, really thick. And the one that's really cramped and really small is not getting enough nourishment. So really good ultrasound later here at MU hospitals, they say, well, you know, maybe the littler one doesn't have kidneys. Um, you need to start exploring your options here. And so well, what are our options? Well, you don't have any options here because we don't do that kind of specialty surgery, review your facilities and nationally. Basically, what was then recommended was a procedure where we would go and tie off the umbilical cord of a smaller twin in hopes of saving a larger one. Well, it's kind of crazy because you have to then schedule that, which takes a little bit of time. And then you have to schedule traveling. You, know, you can't fly. Airlines will not fly high-risk pregnancies. So we had to get into a van and put my wife on bed rest in a cot and go to Florida uh, to the hospital. Went to the hospital. Long story short, because we only got a few minutes, they said, well, you know those amnio drainages you did? Well, there are amniotic bands floating around. We can't operate in that environment. You need an abortion. I don't know, this is a Catholic hospital, we don't know of any facilities, just go home, get an abortion. So we called our friends at Planned Parenthood and our physicians and what are we going to do. He recommended going to St. Louis. Oh, we did. And drive to St. Louis to Grand City. And after an exam, they say, well, the head of one twin is too large. And we want to do a procedure. And that and that is referred to Tiller in Wichita. Tiller was a bit over the top, and I'm happy to tell you George Tiller's stories. Uh, because he's quite, he, he's not a shy little butterfly. <laughs> um, but the care that the women were receiving here is very typical. The other thing, a, a little funny story I have to tell you is after the screening, uh, one of the people I know who's a friend who does, works with St. Francis House, but is a true Catholic believer, said, well, that, that movie was so biased. Well, they, they did talk to women who regret abortion. And, and then she said, I wonder how many years those people had to interview until they got enough women who had those problems. And I guess one thing that stands out for me is, at least at Tiller's practice, he told me he had about five fetal anomaly cases, usually in the clinic at one time. And when we were there, there were three, including ourselves. Um, after the abortions, and, and the, the, the clinic was got awful. Uh, after the abortions, Tiller said, well, you know, I'd like to baptize your, your boys. <clears throat> A little tough part. Uh, and he did that, and I, he let me hold them, and I thought, that's really nice. And he kind of stepped back a little bit away. He did not cry, but he kind of did, wiped a few tears away. And he said, that's, that's very good. He had them wrapped up in little baby towels and so forth. Um, and we went back. Now, usually, one of the things that makes it a little weird is, I'm a man telling the story. And um, it's also been a few years. I'm a little grayer now than I was then. But at that experience, I thought, if there's anything I can do to help other women in similar situations, I would do it. Uh, the other small thing that needs to be said is Tiller also gave my wife a lot of verses. <laughs> so for her, that week's week end experience is kind of a haze. So she doesn't remember a lot of the things. But the following week after, there was this envelope from the women's clinic in Wichita. And I opened it up, and there was a card. And it had dignity and respect written on the side. And I opened it up, and he had taken pictures of our boy. Now, since then, I've talked with a lot of women, from testimony, from writing letters to the Kansas City Star, and so forth. Tiller was very complicated. I mean, he, there, other women have told me, you know, I went for an abortion in Wichita, and he said, I'm sorry, this is too far along, I can't do that, but I will help you place 
as an adoption. And he assisted with that. Uh, there are women who are doing better and worse throughout the state. Now, one of life's small ironies is as a psychologist, I research health things on the film book. But the vital statistics are a member of public record as to how many abortions are done in the state of Missouri. And this, the third trimester abortion rate in Missouri is steady. It is not falling off, it is not increasing. And it's about 100 women a year. Uh, so Sandy Hook happened, and all those children lost their lives. But if we took a look at 100 women every year in Missouri alone, or going through this issue, I think it's a significant issue. And I'm happy to talk or answer any questions. It's kind of funny when I testify to the Senate people, I tell them my story, and then are there any questions? No, no, no questions from you. But you know, this is a very comfortable space, so by all means, if you have some questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Phil. shared your story several times with me and each time it gets me um, and um, both you know of talking about Dr. Tiller and connecting that to the movie of you know of, of that these are everyday people um, the doctors are everyday people who um, just want to do the best and take care of patients um, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share your story to show that this um, what is in the movie happens to everyday people everywhere across the state. You know that Bill is from Columbia, um, and we know lots of other women from Columbia that have had to seek services or haven't been able to get the services, haven't been able to um, to make it to wherever they need to go in order to get those services. And so, um, go ahead, Margie has a question. Well, we obviously do not have an outpatient facility in Missouri that does state trimester abortion, so I assume that the 100 women per year that have third trimester abortions are for fetal anomalies that are done in the hospital, is that right? You know? They're not done in the hospital, they're traveling. Oh, so it's Missouri but as women residents of the state elsewhere. of Missouri, it gets okay. reported. And some of the some of them, the vital statistics are 21 weeks and above, mm -hmm. and so um, we can go in Missouri up to 22 weeks. So some of them would fall into Missouri, but some of them are captured that they right. are Missouri women. Missouri 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 and it's listed by age of the woman and the type of abortion provided. The laminaria that you described in the movie is, is very mostly common. There are a few medical ones, so something has gone you know, terribly wrong very quickly for 20% of those. So he had a small operating room at the clinic here. The other thing, I mean, just to, and I don't want to not watch it. The, the, the clinic was really amazing. I mean, first of all, because you had to go through the gate with the cameras and then the metal detector and so forth to get past the guard. But then you came in and there was this huge atrium and it was just walled with small thank you notes of people thanking Dr. Tiller and the family for helping them out. And that was very striking. It also didn't have any observable doors. I mean, kind of the doors opened up and oh, there's a, there's a door to go in. So it was designed so that if anybody did break in, they wouldn't be able to get into the clinic itself. And he had a small, it wasn't quite an operating room, but a small sterile room where he actually did the uh, like trimester abortions. And the, the fetal anomaly cases were kind of shepherded off to the side and were separate from the other women. So I think now we're going to move to Nancy, um, who's just going to share a little bit from sort of the faith perspective, right. you know, that this is obviously such a volatile um, issue. Um, you know, that there's a lot of controversy around it and share a little bit about what's seen in the movie, you know, sort of intertwining the faith perspective to share a little bit and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that Michelle sort of sent to me was, what in the movie touched me the most? And uh, you sort of showed that clip, uh, the clip of the doctor who said, I know what I do and I think about it every day. And, uh, I think the thing that uh, was most important to me is that when we cast people with broad strokes, we don't see their personal struggles. And so when we cast 
Doctors with broad strokes, we don't see their personal struggles. When we cast patients with broad strokes, we don't see their personal struggles. And for me, that's the point where religion is part of the whole thing. Uh, religion, regardless of whether it's Christian or Buddhist or Muslim or uh, uh, spiritual, or just a, a spirituality of some sort, is part of what frames our life view. It's, it's one of the basic constructs that says, this is how I view the world. This is how I put things together. And so um, when, when we began to struggle with life and death issues, our religious perspective is primary in how we do that. And uh, for me, I, I sort of sort out religion into a couple categories. Um, there's my spirituality, which is how I experience the divine or the lack thereof, whether I believe in, whether I'm atheist or agnostic. So how I experience the divine, and then also how I put that together, which is my theology or theology. How do, how do I organize that, and how do I put myself in the midst of the world in context with other people, and with divinity, if I believe in divinity, and, uh, and with the issues of life and death. How do I come into this world? How do I exit this world? And all those sort of shape my life view. Um, so this gets real tangled up because these are real life and death issues for, uh, for women and for doctors. And so um, when, we, when we come to a table where we want to talk about it, uh, we ha can have very opposing views. And the opposing views are not just of one, this one subject but they're opposing views of how the world indeed is constructed. And so if, if I am threatened by my opinion about abortion or pro-choice, then it has the potential of shaking my whole worldview about how the world is. And so um, one of the persons who's been most helpful for me when I think about this whole subject is an author named um, Barry Johnson, who's written a book about managing polarities. Uh, my husband and I used to do family mediation in addition to the things that we've done over the years. And so in working with that, I uh, came across his material. And he says there's some things where we're not ever going to come to the middle. There, there's not going to be some beautiful consensus about what we ought to do. Because there's some issues where our worldviews are so opposed that we really are at the poles in terms of our religious viewpoints and in terms of our viewpoints upon particular issues. And Johnson writes that uh, we're not going to be able to come to a compromise. So what we have to do instead is figure out a way to be appreciative of one another's perspectives. Most of the people in this room, I would guess, uh, lean towards, shall we say, pro-choice. I'm one of those people. And it's <coughs> difficult sometimes for me to think about talking with <coughs> someone who would condemn not only my viewpoint in relationship to choice, but my viewpoint religiously. How can I sit down with that person and be in conversation? Um, Gregory Batson, who is a, a scientist, writes this words, is the human race rotting its mind with slowly deteriorating religion? I think the thing that I want for all of us, regardless of our religious perspective, is the ability to be mindfully aware of how we think and what we're doing. And I realize sometimes it seems like there's a whole lot of people out there that aren't thinking and just reacting. But the thing that I need to remember is that what's at stake for them is their worldview. And I need to be compassionate and open to conversation and try to find ways not to be confrontational but to be open to that exchange <coughs> that comes from managing the polarities. Thank you, Nancy. Uh,
So I think with that, we're just going to open it up. Questions, just raise your hand, and I'll try to, to get to everyone and just have sort of a free flow um, discussion. Because I think, as we talked about yesterday, I mean, one of the, you can answer this, um, one of the, um, your goals and visions of the movie is to open up that dialogue um, and to, especially about such a, a hard subject, even within um, communities that really support reproductive health and the decisions and choices that women make, um, especially when it comes to third term abortion, that there's not always a lot of understanding even in what, what, why would a woman have a third term abortion? And so, um, so that this is sort of the beginning process of let's have an open discussion, ask questions of the filmmakers and um, of Phil and Nancy, and let's begin to start that discussion. So, questions? Questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy, for that. It was so beautifully put. And I love what you said. I mean, I feel like we're so often put into you're pro-choice, you're pro-life, but you know, most people are somewhere in the middle. And you know, is there anyone in the room who would actually say they're against abortions in all circumstances or for abortions in every single, you know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone is somewhere in the middle. So I really appreciate how beautifully you framed that. And I just had a question for Phil. I'm so curious because we never met Dr. Tiller. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about his personality and, and what he was like just as a, as a man, as a doctor. I'm just very curious. Okay. Um, well, can we talk? I mean, the, the, the first time was, I had really kind of wondered, what the heck have I gotten myself into? Because one of the things about my wife's pregnancy is all that amniotic fluid made her look just really, really, really pregnant. So, oh my gosh, the protesters really howl a lot when they saw us walking up to the clinic. And his first words to my wife were, my God, woman, what did you do, swallow a basketball? <laughs> <laughs> and I was used to these, you know, hushed, quiet tones. <laughs> and um, he took a bit of time. I mean, I kind of assumed that I'd be sitting in the back, but he took a bit of time to talk to me about that abortion happens, that um, these are the struggles he's had in Kansas. He was also pretty upfront. I said, well, would, would you do this if they outlaw? He said, no, the moment those laws are passed, I will stop doing abortions. And I was kind of surprised because, to be honest, I always kind of had this subtext of somebody somewhere is going to go, oh, well, you're a situation. They'll make an exception for you. No, they won't. Um, and at the end of the time, uh, uh, after the, the twins were delivered, he said, oh, that went a lot better than I thought it would. How about you buy the gang pizza? <laughs> so I went up and I got his gang pizza. Um, it's, I guess, I kind of had a question, because one of the things that stands out for me is not only these value differences, mm -hmm. but we have a profound disagreement with and I'll say conservative Republicans, and I can tell stories about Oklahoma, about how democracy functions. And it's one thing to say you have different values, but it's another to say, I will legislate against your religious view. And it's a, your, your view of democracy is entirely without merit. And I have trouble even thinking about what that middle ground would be. I wondered if you had some thoughts about that. I guess, um as I guess I'll, I'll claim for myself as a religious leader, one of my greatest concerns is um, our current, and I'll, I'll be generous with it and say conversation, uh, about the separation of church and state. And, and, and I think that's, that's at the heart of some of what we're talking about. How, it, how is it that, that we um, allow for religious freedom and still do democratic conversation. And I think that uh, if we jump to the end, for what, what do we do next? Uh, I think one of, the, one of the things that all persons of faith or persons of democratic bent, either one, need to be aware of is how do we, how do we create an atmosphere that allows dialogue? And part of that is the responsibility of the democratic process. And, and uh, we're in big trouble, uh, not just around this issue, but around a lot of issues. And, and so how, how do we affect the democratic process so that there is an arena for conversation legally 
as well as, as the encouragement of, uh, of diversity that will allow for uh, freedom of choice in all areas, not just in this area. Um. <coughs> Yeah, I, I, when you were talking about the differences in people, um, I, something that has concerned me for years in, in, and grow, grow increasingly in this atmosphere of refusing to talk to one another. I mm -hmm. mean, it has been, it has been, it's so that you can't talk in the workplace. It is, it is frowned upon to discuss issues like, you know, any kind of political issue in the workplace. And what encourages me, I'm from Cincinnati, and um, I'm seeing groups form now, mm -hmm. uh, public groups that are um, going out into the community, bringing together people of, well-known people of opposing views to have civil discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think that it applies to all of these issues. And I'd like to point out one other thing that we always have to keep in mind when people are, when we're trying to understand one another. It isn't just values and conservative versus liberal or religious things. It is how people think and communicate. Mm -hmm. There are, um, in like technology companies, they have internal training sessions with their geeks and their marketers and they recognize the difference in right brain and left brain thinking and they have seminars in how to communicate with people who think differently than you, who express themselves differently from you. Uh, so it is a more complex thing, but I just point that out that that's another function of understanding one another. Good. Yes? Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate what all of you have had to say, and, and I think that your film, what it really does is it helps build that bridge of understanding between the polarities so that we can start to um, to communicate more effectively, and I think that's what each of your um, stories does as well. It, it helps us understand all of the different facets of these difficult decisions that people have to make. So I am kind of curious to know, um, of the filmmakers, how are you, um, I did hear a little bit last night about the distribution and so forth, but I'm wondering, do you have um, a plan for getting this film in front of the different different groups of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's something we definitely want to do. You know, like we said, um, last night we're going to have a theatrical distribution, and then we want to take the film to um, community centers and churches and basically, you know, laundromats, wherever <laughs> they'll show the film, um, and try to um, start those conversations. And yeah, I mean, you know, we're sort of, you know, we live in New York, we're a little bit isolated um, at, in that sense, and just, I think you know Planned Parenthood and other pro-choice groups have been really amazing about sort of jumping on board and wanting to show the film. I think what we need more help with is how we can get it to people on the other side, and um, you know, and that's you know we'll do all the outreach that we can. But there is, I think, you know, a lot of sort of skepticism and suspicion of the intentions of someone like us, you know, reaching out to a group that might be more anti-abortion or a Catholic group or something like that. So how do we sort of make them see that we're not trying to, we're not trying to show them a bunch of propaganda, we're trying to just have a conversation. And um, I mean, and that's sort of a question that I was curious about with you was just, you know, you said you were talking to your friend from the Newman Center. And just, you know, if, if she asked this question, well, they must have taken so long to find these people with these stories. But then like, where does the conversation go from there? Because I do feel like, on the anti-abortion side, there's a lot of, there's just so many sort of misconceptions, and like, you know, she probably really believes that this is an extremely rare situation for a woman to find herself. Well, I don't know if I said this, but we were, we were in queue to go to the village at the end of the world, and we just popped across the street to go to Panera to get, you know, a little snack for my son and so forth, and while I was waiting for his, my son's coffee drink that he likes, I mean, we just had this conversation. I, it kept, it's a tribute to the fact that the movie was very upsetting to her. Mm -hmm. uh, but I kept thinking, bring the coffee out again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll be interested in that. I think, you know, kind of coming professionally at this or just watching Michelle in action or the people in Kansas or Oklahoma in action. 
their worldview, I mean, if you were a legislator, it would be hard to make a decision because you get, here's a medical authority who comes in and says, third trimester abortions never happen. Women don't have these problems. You know, and I keep thinking, hello? You know, and, and it's kind of like, you know, officially our, med our professional opinion is you don't exist. And how do you then tell a legislator this story and get it across when there's expertise on the other side? I don't know if you have any thoughts about it. What is it like to do this for a living here after <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's very tough because it's a box that, that everybody sort of puts themselves in of this is what I view, this is my belief, and what you say isn't going to persuade me. And there's, I mean, whether it's our issue or um, some other issue, gun control or whatever, whatever sort of controversial issues that there are, people sort of have their beliefs and they're in their box and you can present your information to me. And you helped me the other day, you helped me the other day, some you know, legislator said, oh, but what about this study in Finland that said this, that, and the other thing you know, about how horrible abortion is and how women regret it and are gonna commit suicide if they have it and all this other stuff and you, where it's like, wait a minute, those those facts aren't right. It's so not even an index research journal. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and so and so that that's you know that there's always that push pull of what information is correct, and then people in the middle have to filter out what do I believe, yes. um, what information am I getting, what is credible, what is not credible, um, and that's where I think people really struggle because they don't know who to believe. Um, they don't know what to turn to. This research study says this, this research study says that. And so, and um, especially when it comes to legislators, they're in their box and they're not gonna move for anything. It's personal stories are the, the one way that we've seen them um, because it puts it, you can't deny it. You can't deny the fact that you're sharing your story and this actually happened to you. Um, and so it's those personal stories um, which are so hard and, and you're so brave to share it um, because um, it, it's, it's, it's hard for women to, to go up and to share that story and to not know um, what that reaction is going to be, especially from a legislator, um, where they can be dismissive or they can really embrace it. And so it's, um, it's those sort of personal stories and it's the, those conversations, I think, is what I'm really hoping that the movie will bring um, to give women and families the space to say, wait, this is my story, and this is why it's also important that people know that. Um, so. Yeah, I think it is really about storytelling, and you know, that's why we made a documentary film, because this is the best way to tell these patients' stories, to capture them, and you're so right, when you, when you look at them as scientific evidence, what is credible, what is not credible, when you're in the room, one of these patients going through this devastating decision, I don't think anyone could watch this and say that that woman's making this up. This is incredible. I don't, you know what I mean? Right. You can really right. feel it. And uh, yeah, although it's interesting, your your friends' comments seem that these are kind of rare cases and a million of others. I think, yeah, maybe it's just about patience and just sort of, you know, if we can get people to see the movie who have different views, then maybe the day after they're still going to be saying, well, that's just that's just a fluke, but maybe thinking about it over time, it does sort of more slowly start to change the way people think about it. Is there any attempt to get, uh, or any avenue, to get this into classrooms? Yeah, College absolutely. Classrooms? Yeah. I mean, it does challenge your thinking. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people at that stage, they're, they may think they know what they believe or, <laughs> or have made their minds up, but and yet that's a, a, you know, such a pivotal time mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. opening your thinking of, to be challenged. That's a great point, yeah. It, you know, Martha and I are 29, and there's a statistic that is uh, the, the, the support for abortion rights is dropping the fastest among women under age 30. Just kind of That's because they don't remember it not being available. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think we take yeah. these rights a bit for granted because we weren't around when this battle happened, and we didn't see what it was like before when abortion wasn't available. You're totally right. right. So, so colleges and universities are really important to us. And yes, we're, uh, we're our distributor is going to do a special educational distribution thing where it's available to professors before it's even available on DVD. To because there's so many curriculums it can tie into. You know, yes. beyond women's studies, there's health, there's ethics, there's philosophy, social well, work, science. so much stuff. And you and you're so right that that audience is incredibly, incredibly important. Yeah. 
Case one and two, um, it just kind of reflects the compassion. I just feel so moved by what you guys did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you're on either pole, do you have any compassion? You know, this is all about the middle. This is all about the gray area. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you guys are so clear about that. You know, the different layers of the film, you you show these doctors in such a compassionate light. I mean, I want them to be my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> they listen. They touch their patients. They have time. That's not the modern medicine practice. So the compassion that they had, I love that you showed their spouses mm -hmm. and how they were supported so compassionately by their families, by their spouses. I thought that was a really sweet layer to the film. And I love it that you guys are willing to be out in communities with this because I think your, your energy is so clear and compassionate. It's not like you're you're not, I, I don't get anything polarizing from you or the movie in any way. It's just clearly put that this is an important thing that needs compassion from, particularly from the edges, which don't, I don't think have any. So thank you. Can I speak to that just a, just a bit? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm chief among sinners, to use biblical language, which I don't do very often. Anyway, uh, it's interesting when we talk about being in conversation with someone whose opinion is different than ours. If we listen, if I listen to myself, if we listen to one another, what we talk about is persuasion. And it seems to me that part of the issue is compassionate listening. If I can listen to someone whose opinion is different than mine without needing to persuade them, mm -hmm. that's a beginning. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's hard work for me because I feel so strongly, so passionately about the right to choose. Can you have passion and compassion? Yeah, at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think for those of us in this room to, to Find ways to listen to people who do not agree with us. And to be in dialogue is, is an important piece of it. And, and, and they're not going to come looking for you. And the other, the other thing, I would hope that there is some sort of discussion guidelines and some, and some things about creative communication that can go out with the film so that in, in, in a variety of places, uh, and, and those are different whether they're distributed to the laundromat or to the classroom, mm -hmm. and, and how, how, do we, how, do, how do those reflect that difference and encourage creative dialogue, yeah. creative compassionate conversation. Absolutely. Compassionate conversation, I think it's better than dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I hope that, uh, I think one of the hardest things is, is trusting that everyone has good intentions. You know, oh, I yeah. think that even a lot of the protesters have good intentions. That's right. You know, and we, we try to, you can, you can understand, you know, there's a, a clip in the film where there's a, a city council protest, and one of the protesters is there with her baby and says, you know, my son was born at 27 weeks, I just can't believe, and you can kind of understand someone going through an That's experience right. like that, mm -hmm. not being able to get the other side on this issue. But I think it's, it's yeah, about maybe just broadening people's perspectives. Um, but uh, everyone does have good intentions, and you're sorry that a lot of times in these conversations we're not, people don't even respect each other's intentions. They just assume you don't know what you're talking about, you're coming from a bad place, but uh, it's just key to keep in mind. Well, I was just thinking about how um, True Falls is such a perfect venue for this film, and um, that um, one of the founders was uh, talking about how there was an evangelical church that was a sponsor of the True Falls Festival, and I, I, I'm wondering if they, if that sponsor, yeah. um, you know, would be a step in helping to, you know, to really get these human stories out. Yeah, you know, good news. Because actually, that, yeah. yeah, David actually came to us yesterday and told us that he, you know, he had shown the film to the pastor of that church, which he said it has like 2,500. 
um, members and that the pastor wanted to show the film at his church and do an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's a yeah. very yeah. diverse yeah. congregation. It's a, it's, it's, a, a, it's a very diverse congregation. Yeah. There are pro-choice people there, and there are people who would be very, who would have a very difficult time having the conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Everybody in between. Mm -hmm. I think what you know what David said was that he, this pastor, considers himself very much pro-life, but just said, you know, we have a responsibility to really understand um, the situations that women, these women and these doctors, find themselves in. And you know you can't really say that you're pro-life without having all this information, without having seen the film and having this more intimate understanding. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. Other questions, thoughts, favorite clips? Um, to uh, Alana and Martha, uh, you guys mentioned um, Dr. Taylor's lack of talk to the media. He didn't want to. Do you think that affected the misconceptions that people? have about third, tri third trimester abortions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's been a kind of vacuum around this. And so when there's a vacuum, it just gets filled in by the anti-abortion movement. It's just been a lot more aggressive with you know the media and getting stuff out there. But you know, I think it's also that even the pro-choice movement is very uncomfortable at talking about this. I mean, look at, they've been focused on contraception and saying, you know, you can get pregnant from being raped. They just focus on some very basic stuff. I think, you know, it's a bit, a lot of people also we started making this film that, you know, first abortion isn't really on message for the uh, pro-choice movement. You know, you, you know this experience. People just are uncomfortable talking about it. These aren't, as you see from the film, these aren't black and white cases. It's, it's very gray, and that's just the reality of women's lives. Women are coming from imperfect situations. Life is complicated. I think we all, most people know that personally, but it doesn't really help for uh, advocacy platforms to show more complicated stories. Was, was the feeling of the pro-choice movement? So I think that's why they weren't really addressing just the basic facts about third trimester abortion. It's been interesting to us too, to us, uh, even just basic things about the procedure. So many people have seen this movie and learned that it's a labor and delivery process, that you just euthanize it, it's a labor and delivery process, and they say, wow, that is, so much better than I thought it was. They all think it was some, you know, gory, horrible nightmare. Uh, just the basic conceptions about the procedure, no one had any idea, even pro-choice people. And uh, one thing I was telling Judith the other day that's surprising too is that a patient went to see, Dr. Robinson told us about a patient who came to see her, who uh, had her counseling session with Dr. Robinson, and at the very end, Dr. Robinson said, any more questions? And the patient said, yes, so I, I have a 50% chance of dying from this, is that right? And Dr. Robinson said, you know, no, but to think that a woman would mm. think that she had a 50% chance of dying and still oh, came so to the clinic, I think shows the level of desperation that these patients are in, but even that these misconceptions are filtered down to all of the patients who are coming to these clinics as well. And, yeah. and just a little bit further to answer your question of <coughs> that these doctors, they're, they're busy taking care of patients. That's what they're doing. Um, and yeah. there's so few of them that trying to, to go to the media and explain everything and get all the facts out there, that's, that's not their, their job. Like their job is they're taking care of patients and that's where they want to spend their time um, and not to become a political spokesperson on about why we need to continue to have access to these services. And, and you're right, it's very hard for the pro-choice movement because it's a place that's uncomfortable and people push back and fight against and um, it's uncomfortable within our own movement um, to understand the reasons of what would lead someone to need these services. Why didn't they go at the first trimester and, and to really dig in? And the movie so beautifully showcases the complexity of reasons um, and all the circumstances. And this is where then, for me, it draws into the political layer and all the laws and all the regulations that are on the books and the hoops that women have to jump through that delay them where they, they knew it in eight weeks that they wanted to mm -hmm. have an abortion, but they couldn't actually receive the services until 25 weeks mm -hmm. because because our legislators have created an environment that makes it inaccessible to them. And so like, there's that connection to, in addition to just all the various complexities that, that maybe you don't know until later, and so. Um, I just have one, I was curious about something. Was one of the clinics, were any of the clinics less um, uh, under attack from protesters? 
Was the New Mexico yeah. clinic less? Boulder is less under attack. Oh, Boulder. It's a very welcoming oh, environment in Boulder. We actually were filming establishing shots of the clinic one time, and uh, a guy drove by in a car, a classic kind of Boulder flowing white beard, no tie dye t shirt, and he yelled at us, This is a right in this country! Fuck you! <laughs> <laughs> and because he thought we were a protest. We <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very supportive environment. <laughs> Interesting. Just to, to, to make the, the Columbia protection or connection is, I think people obviously know we have some pretty harassing protesters outside of the Planned Parenthood Health Center. And um, we do, several of you in here are patient escorts that escort patients um, into the health center. And when we do trainings for the escorts that we are outside for part of the training, just like sort of showing the uh, you know where protesters can and can't be and this is what it looks like and just sort of doing a bit of the training and twice this has happened where people have driven by one time someone came into the parking lot because there's a group of 30 people standing in the parking lots after hours and they're like you can't be here get off you know, they're like so protected um, even you know in Colombia where we deal with the protesters and we know that they're there that, that they know that there's boundaries yeah. and that our supporters are very protective of wait wait there's some you there you have the right to be out there but there's a boundary and when they think that they're they're in our parking lot or they cross that boundary people are willing to say wait a minute and one time I was like wait why are you here because I thought it was some I thought it was um, someone from the other side, and they were like, I just want to make sure everything's okay. Like, I support you guys. I just want to be outside doing something. I was yeah. like, no, we're good. <laughs> yeah, the environment's so specific. In Nebraska, it feels like it's under siege there with the protesters. Mm -hmm. There's so many people, the clinic feels a bit like a fortress. And yeah. it's an interesting question. I think all the doctors, you know, do, these, there's freedom of speech. These people do have the right to protest there. The doctors have attended different kinds of protests themselves. They have the right to be there. But on the other hand, you know, Dr. Hearn points out that every person who has shot, assassinated an abortion doctor began as a peaceful protester. So, you know, you can understand, mm -hmm. like, they have the right to do this, but it's also going to say, Mary Carhartt's, Dr. Carhartt's wife's favorite protesters are the ones that have the life tape on their mouths that are completely <laughs> silent. <laughs> 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 and we just struck me in that. Yeah. Yeah. She's very calm then. <laughs> Well, I have a question um, on um, one of the assistants to, to the doctor was telling a lady, you need to know you need $10,000 to come. Mm -hmm. Is that what, what a late term abortion usually costs? And how do some of these, do we have some ways to help some of these poor women who to, um, to mm -hmm. gather that money? I mean, a lot of the people who are needing these are people who almost couldn't afford it birth control, mm -hmm. and then to tell them they need $10,000, yeah. how does that all work? Yeah. Can you give me any information on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, these are extremely expensive procedures, and we actually talked a lot about including that scene, because on the one hand, it feels like it's important to know how much it costs, because you then you realize, wow, like, if someone's, you know, overcoming all the obstacles to get to this clinic and trying to put together this money, they're really, really dedicated and really, really desperate. But, I mean, for the most part, most women don't end up paying that full amount. The clinics do a lot of loans to women, um, and then there's a lot of funds that, that help support it. So there's the abortion access fund, and every state, most states, I think, have their own funds. So, and that the National Abortion Federation does, has a fund. So they'll, the clinics will put pe women in touch with all those different organizations and start trying to put together um, the money from all different sources. Because yeah, as you, as you can see, I mean, that's like many of the women are in really bad socioeconomic circumstances and, and um, it's, a, it's a lot of money. And I, I think the other thing though is that, you know, it's a four day outpatient surgical procedure. So 10,000 sounds like so much. And I think, you know, that's the other reason why we talked a lot about including it is we didn't want to play into this idea that like these doctors are getting rich off it because that's a, obviously the thing that all the anti-abortion people say um and it's i mean first of all it's not true you can see the way they live and it's you know they all live in fairly modest circumstances um but but yes but I, we just thought it was important to and to layer i was going to say there's a patient in the film if you saw it who Part of the reason she was delayed is because it took her time to raise the money 
and, uh, and we did a lot of rough cut test screenings and a lot of people said, I just don't understand that woman, why it took her so long to raise the money, I can't believe it took her months. And we said, well, how, how much do you think an abortion costs? And we said, $500. Right. So that's when we put the shot of right. showing how much it actually costs. Yeah. That's surprised. the perception. Why would you be? I mean, if right. you have a four right. day outpatient, right. 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 that's yeah. the thing at university and hospital, yeah. it would probably cost you $50,000. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then that layers on again to the regulations that states have around insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these women may not have insurance access to insurance coverage, so that's an issue in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But even if you have insurance coverage in Missouri, you can't, if insurance coverage the state law cannot cover abortion services, um, even if they're the you know Blue Cross Blue Shield wanted to have a policy, or they have a policy in other states that cover abortion coverage. It cannot cover abortion coverage, and so women are paying out of out of pocket. Um, and then when we don't allow um, other medical facilities to be covering these services, you know that you can't get an abortion in a hospital, et cetera, that that just, again, layers on to women having to travel across the country. Yeah. And then it is obviously then a, a difference in the four-day procedure if you were having it at the University of Missouri, but it still is extremely um, expensive for yeah. women who are seeking Let's services. kind of also say MU doesn't cover any kind of abortion. And under Obamacare, you know, when I mentioned it to some of the people here, oh, well, the professors, you're all old. Why do you care about abortion? But it's our children who are covered now under the insurance, and they will not have that coverage. I have a small nosy question. Now, you've done a great job of talking in front of people, and it's a perfect play to do this about the doctors, because you can't say, oh, it was about women who went through with this, and oh, you didn't include the women who, who regret it, and so forth. Have any questions from the audience ever caught you flat-footed that the next day you thought, oh, well, the thing I should have said was? I mean, so very yeah. You know, that's really good. I mean, I think. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> every question, pretty much. I yeah. Mean, no. no, I mean, I think that there's two questions. I think honestly, the only two questions we've screened the film maybe nine times now. Um, the only two questions. Someone asked a question about science at a screening here. You know, why didn't you cover the science of abortion? And I was a little bit like. Because I didn't know if it was an anti-abortion sa person was. saying, yeah, I mean, yeah. I sort of assumed saying, why didn't you talk about the science of fetal pain? No, and we're um, not scientists, we're not experts. We're yeah, not and I just, you know, you know, so that's sort of what, that's sort of what I said. And, yeah. like, and I just didn't feel like there would be an audience for that, but I wasn't quite sure. And then there was another person who said, why didn't, you know, did you um, think about including the stories of women who regret their abortions going on. And I said, you know, I think it'd be interesting to do a film that would show, you know, a longer journey of a woman and, and see um, what her experience is. But, I mean, those, that's literally the only two questions that we've had that have been sort of provocative or I felt like they were coming from an anti-abortion perspective. So I think, you know, we're, we started in the West in Utah Sundance, and now we're in the heartland, and next we're going to the South. <laughs> <laughs> those kind of questions yeah. and we want you know challenging questions mm -hmm. and uh, yeah the worst case scenario I think we've learned from the best person at Q&A is I really think is Sarah Palin if you don't know what to say just <laughs> confidently talk about something <laughs> <laughs> that's our backup plan <laughs> 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 I, I, I just have a question for both of you is that I mean you, you came to the movie from a pro-choice perspective, um, but you know, were you intending for it to be sort of a political game changer um, or dialogue changer in the the pro-choice movement? And you know, you're you're doing these discussions, and uh, the audiences are obviously mostly pro-choice audiences, and you're. You're becoming, like, did you come to it with like, okay, we wanted to do this for a political reason to move the pro-choice movement forward? Um, or how are you stepping into that role? Are you trying to stay away from the role? And just as a journalist, that we're just showing this film and what you guys do with it is what you guys do with it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I think we came to it with the curiosity about what kinds of people these doctors were, more than a specific advocacy agenda or anything like that. Yeah, I think it's about humanizing the doctors, and I think we felt like, you know, no matter, you can disagree with certain trimester abortion, you can disagree with certain decisions the doctors make, whatever you feel politically, can't we all at least agree that these doctors shouldn't be targeted in this way and harassed, and the number of 
assassinations of abortion doctors mm -hmm. in this country is, is shocking. So can't we at least, you know, calm down the conversation, humanize these people who are at the center of it, politics aside. Right. So, you know, and then going forward, uh, yeah, I, we're very interested to see how different groups can use this right. film to further uh, their policy goals. And, that's great. I, I, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when we screen it at places like this church what they all think of it. And yeah, I can't see. But we came into it. The initial impetus wasn't an advocacy one. It was more just curiosity about these people, and we learned a lot as we as we went along. Yeah, I mean, and I think just you know something that we've talked to. Like we had an amazing conversation yesterday with all the local reproductive rights activists and um, people who work in this field. And I think it's about sort of like giving finding out how you guys can use a film, but also still maintaining, you know, being independent filmmakers and not being sort of like, because I think what we, we do have to avoid is the sense that like, this film was made by Planned Parenthood or something, because then we won't be able to reach both sides. So how can we like, you know, give you guys all the tools you need to use the film and learn as much as possible, and then also maintain um, some independence? It's better too, because you know, we're not experts on this. Yeah, like, you exactly. Are, you, don't, you don't really know what we're yeah. talking about. Better for us to not you talk about policy. You definitely sound like these. No, we sound like these. I'm thinking about uh, long ago my first interview for medical school. And the physician asked a few questions. And then he asked me, what do you think about Karen Ann Quinlan? What do you think about abortion? And mm -hmm. I was, what, 20 years old or something? And I, I did have opinions about that, and I said, why, in each of those is roughly extraordinarily difficult decisions. You really need to be made at the most personal level and not be legislated. His wow. immediate response was, I think we're done here. That was my fastest rejection for medical school. Wow. I did get into the medical school. Uh, but so I really like that idea about showing that film to younger people who maybe have not lived through some of different things and they will be the future voters. Uh, yeah. And I'm also thinking about medical audience. Yeah. We probably have, you know, polarity there. And uh, anyway, sometimes physicians and healthcare providers can be influenced in other ways. Yeah, that's an extraordinary story. Wow. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and then the generational things I was just thinking too, yeah, there's a lot of I hope there's some stuff in the film that you know, that's a conversation can also go in the future that we've thought about too is most of you saw the film, there's a sixteen year old patient at the end, for instance, who says she's pro life, she was afraid to tell her mother about the pregnancy, she's very conflicted about it. And um, I think it's about looking at what are the circumstances that lead women to end up here. That's another thing I think we can all agree on. Can we all agree that, you know, did this 16-year-old girl have sex education? Did this 16-year-old girl have a responsible adult she felt comfortable talking to? Was this 16-year-old girl coerced into having sex with someone? You know, what happened here? Can we all look at that politics aside and how can we prevent this from happening to other people? That's another point of common agreement that maybe we can, we can move forward. Uh, I was really troubled by the fact that there's no um, sort of plan for the future with these doctors in terms of uh, cultivating other doctors mm -hmm. to come into the trade and continue the work. I mean, the end, at the end you talk about Dr. Robinson and then and the Dr. Seeler or Sella, Sella, yeah. Sella um, bringing another doctor on, but and, I, and I'm not. Um, trying to sound naive about the, the challenge of that, but can you can you talk more about the challenge of that um, and what what discussions you might have had with them about, about it? Yeah. Good news about that, Doctor, is she's only 34 years old, she's been trained, <laughs> so that's one good thing. But. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why actually, you know, one of, we see one of our major target audiences as being medical students um, I think the challenge with that is just going to be to, you know, convince them to spend an hour and a half watching the film or whatever <laughs> amount of time, given that they don't ever sleep at all. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think um, that's something that all the doctors think about a lot because they are getting older. And, you know, Dr. Carhart has said he thinks this is really sort of like a second career type thing, like maybe a doctor who's been doing something else and their kids are grown up and 
I think you said or someone told us that there was a doctor in Missouri who was doing providing abortions, but her children were just being harassed so much that she decided to um, step away from it. And so I think, yeah, it's about sort of how do you find those people? There's just so, you know, I think the question going into it, how can there only be four doctors? I think after watching the film, you sort of understand, you know, the incredible, you know, how emotionally difficult this work is how, you know, it takes a really special person who both can handle the medical side, but also the emotional side, the therapy side, and then um, is willing to put their life on the line, basically. Right. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a really a great challenge, but I hope that the film can do something to, to help. I think right on about showing it to medical schools, and not only third trimester abortions, I mean, we're losing yeah. doctors Sure. willing to perform first trimesters or even non-surgical abortions because of the harassment and the intimidation mm -hmm. and really creating an environment that supports them mm -hmm. and, um, and what they do and so um, Judith yeah and I mean only eight minutes left I was just wondering if maybe you could talk about the legislation and the hearing on Wednesday and and just and tell everybody <coughs> I, I found that to be extraordinary yeah the tie to the movie mm -hmm. A good, um, unfortunately, a, a tie a, um, layering, and so I mean, I think everyone knows that you know rights and legislation, you know, it's under attack. Um, and in Missouri, you know, these third trimester abortions aren't legal in Missouri, and they haven't been for a long time, and so women can't access those services here in Missouri. And then we have all sorts of regulations on the book. Um, and unfortunately, there is a piece of legislation that's going to have a hearing on Wednesday that ties directly to the movie um, in terms of fetal anomalies. It would be on all abortions at any stage um, based on if you are seeking those abortions based on a fetal anomaly, um, which um, is any fetal anomaly. So even if the fetal anomaly is going to have a, a fatal results, you know, either in the womb or shortly after outside of giving birth. And it's, it's just fascinating to me because as much as third trimester abortions are hard to talk about, um, that those are the situations when you're able to get the story across that people say, I would never want to be in your situation and I would never want to have to make the decision that you made, but yet then here we're going to be having a hearing. We had this hearing last year at the very end of session so we knew that the bill wasn't going to be going anywhere and how these legislators just, it's its troubling to me, you know, and I, I do do this on a daily basis, of the, that they just sort of have a blank wall and that they're so in their own box um, and say, well, Right to Life says I need to support this, so I'm going to support it, that they don't open up their minds mm -hmm. to hear the stories. We presented a story to them. A woman testified last year with her own story of really tragic fetal anomalies and an abortion that took place at 20 weeks and shared her personal story. And while they were able to hear it, it doesn't change their minds. Um, and that that's it's very troubling and just about how we got to continue to use the stories that you share stories you know Phil's story and other stories that are out there to you know it's I think somebody it's the saying that you know somebody has to hear something seven times before they get it you know before they really remember it and understand it and so that's why we've got to keep you know putting those stories in front of them but that this is you know this is what's out there this is what that they're doing you know in the Missouri legislature to try to continue to restrict access to abortion care and that you know in this case, you know, they're doing it for these extreme circumstances where women have nowhere else to go, you know, where then they will have to um, to find either to go to another state to travel in circumstances where they may not even be able to travel to. Um, or try to do it themselves. Mm -hmm, exactly. I mean, Dr. Carhart said that several times yesterday or in the movie of, you know, if women don't have access, they're gonna, they're and they're desperate what enough. What will they? What you know, will they Michelle, the thing that I think is so interesting about that is that there seems to be some um, concept, some perception that if we illegalize it, the problem will go away, mm -hmm. the practice will go away, that women won't have abortions anymore. Right. You know, which isn't what's going to happen. It's right. like. 
Yes. And you can look at Latin America. I mean, if people talk about it like it's this hypothetical situation, like abortion is illegal, the problem will go away, but right. look at what's happening in Latin America. All right. these women who are dying from illegal abortions. I mean, right. this isn't a hypothetical circumstance. You just look at what's going on in other places. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. And here not that long ago. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, what the, the movie, you know, can, can do, and I'm always hesitant to ask people to go testify in front of the legislature. It's a, it's, a, it's a big risk that you're taking on personally that you don't know how people are going to react to you and you're putting yourself out there. Um, but that the movie, you know, and through discussion groups or through viewing in various places, um, because we know women are out there, um, and that it creates an environment to where a respectful environment that if I share my story, you're going to listen to me in a respectful way to give women the support and families the support um, that they need to feel like I would be willing to go share my story because I knew that the, the, the culture around it has changed to where it's not going to be, I'm going to be told what I did was wrong or I didn't have the right information. If I would have waited, something else would have happened because that that's um, that that's that's what women and families get right now, and so that you know you know I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, um, but that you know if there could be a culture shift around um, conversations around it where it is coming from that mutual respect, and maybe I don't agree with you, but I'm going to listen to your story in a respectful way and be open to what your story says. That maybe it would change my mind. I mean, and then we talked about this last night after the movie of. Um, you know, why would someone, why would a pro-choice person go see that movie? You know, what do I have to learn from the movie? And, you know, just in talking in general as it released, how do we get sort of our own supporters to come and see the movie and why should they see the movie? And, you know, as someone who's been doing this for a long time, I learned something in the movie and I'm challenged of what, what does it mean? And when Dr. Robinson was like, why do I get to decide? Why do I get to decide about your story was good enough to, for me and convinced me your story, maybe you're just not a good storyteller. Like that that was just so powerful to me of uh, just like well, how you know, you know, I, why do I get to decide and why does the legislature get to decide or why does anyone get to decide? Like women know what they need. So Yeah. And I think the two people about the film talk a little about one of the other things that that I think pro choice people have to think about seeing this which is realizing that being, if you're really pro-choice, part of that is being okay with other people making decisions you might right. totally disagree mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And it might not be the right decision. Right. You know, Dr. Silla talks in the film, yes, patients could regret this, because those little patients could regret this. Maybe it was the wrong decision. You know, who knows, you, later, right. you have to think back, where were you at that time? Right. Have sympathy for yourself for making that decision. But, you know, let's acknowledge it. You know, a lot of times pro-choice people are saying, Women know what the right decision is. Well, you know, we're all imperfect. Right. We don't know what the right decision is. Or, you know, you're dealing with right. the best situation you right. can at the time. So that's hard to acknowledge. So there's two questions. So we're going to go with Lana. We're <laughs> name <laughs> Lana, too? Oh, cool. <laughs> 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 um, I just I would like to extend the biggest hug to both of you and to the directors of your films for starting this conversation. It's, it's you should email them and tell them to bring us back next year. <laughs> 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 but, but, True Falls is the one time of the year, I think, for our community where you can just start up a conversation with a totally random person about what movie you've seen. And I, I heard so many positive comments about your movie and um, you know, that people, just strangers, and, you know, and could speak to each other candidly uh -huh. um, is one thing. And I, I also am a volunteer at our Planned Parenthood Clinic and I'm um, a patient as and it's a wild volunteer job. I were just talking about it. And to have um, to have your movie and to hear all of those people just applauding was so meaningful because we have an invisible volunteer job. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people in the community understand that our clinic is under attack, but they don't know what to do. And um, you can volunteer. Um, unfortunately, there are not very many young men who volunteer, and it's scary. So, you know, I'd like to extend um, a request to everybody to, learn to tell other women about the program, to tell, to tell people that we exist, that we are under attack, that um, the people who protest are often not totally quiet. I mean, they, they intimidate, they photograph license plates, they videotape volunteers. It's, it's a crazy job, and it's happening here in our community. So, for all the people who saw the movie, for people who didn't, 
know, we're here and we're trying to do something. And, um, you know, to our doctors and clinic staff, I, I can't even, even begin to imagine. So, yay. <laughs> Thank you. So, with one question over here, sorry, Megan, and then we really do have to wrap up because they have to get um, to the airport. I'm sorry, everybody. That would have been a better comment to wrap up on. I'm not asking complicated questions, but um, I had a question for the filmmakers about a scene in the movie, and I wanted to say first that I really appreciated the movie. It was very challenging to me and affirming to me, and uh, thank you for making the film. Um, I had a question about one of the scenes. The scene was the one in which Dr. Hearn was talking to a woman who had been raped, and then was talking about her process of getting an abortion. And um, he sort of started the conversation with some really good stuff, like you deserve justice and then he kind of transitioned into this place of like, you need to tell the police and you, like, if you don't do this, then other people are going to be, he can do this again. And I think it's relevant as a solidarity issue as we're talking about violence against women and sexual violence. Um, I was kind of surprised to see a scene like that in a movie like this um, because it seemed a little problematic and pretty uh, paternalistic. Um, and I wondered if you guys had any intentions behind it, including that scene or not including that scene, and any like thoughts that you have about that issue. Yeah, yeah I, I think you assessed it really well. I mean, Dr. Hearn is very paternalistic. It is problematic, you know, but that, that's how he is, yeah. And a lot of people have brought that up to us that he seems to really be pushing her. So, you know, maybe it isn't best for her to go to the police, actually. Maybe she shouldn't do that. But, uh, you know, he's very outspoken and which paternalistic, and that's what he thought. It, we thought it was interesting too how uh, the conversation went. She was saying, "Yeah, I wish I would have gone to the police," and and how she was so focused on uh, what if he does this to someone else. It wasn't really like for her that she wanted to go to the police. It was more this guy could go do this to someone else. We thought that was pretty telling. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we put it in the film because there are a lot of patients who were raped or in denial and that's why they're delayed in getting an abortion, so we felt like it represented that aspect of the work. But uh, yeah, I totally hear you on it being a bit paternalistic and problematic in the way Dr. Hearn was over here, but that's just the way he is. Yeah, he's 75. So last comment, Tracy. Yeah, I, um, I just want to say, you know, the film is great, and I want to remind people that March 10th, which is coming up in six days, is, the, is Abortion Provider Appreciation Day which was started when Dr. Gunn was shot, which was the first physician who was shot. And it doesn't just apply to the docs, it applies to anybody who does this work. So to the escorts, to the staff, if you want to know what you can do, you know, send people a card that says we appreciate you. And Card, not food, not um, because unfortunately you can't rules, we don't take food. So, <laughs> And I know some people have dropped off food before. Or post so. it on your Facebook or just something that says, you know, I saw this film and I'm intrigued by the docs. Thank you for what you do. Can I say one more thing? Another thing you can do. Uh, if you don't know about the organization Faith Aloud, I encourage you to be aware of that. Uh, for women who need uh, conversation around religious or faith issues, uh, that, that service is available by phone. And look it up online. F -A it's just spell it out, Faith Aloud with lower caps, dot org. And um, because that's hey, part of it. Yeah, allowed. Yeah, and thank you. A L O U D. F A I T H A L O U D. So with that, um, Martha in the back. For those of you who are wondering um, about how to get involved, that we do have a little five things that you can do if you're interested in being a patient escort. It has the contact information on that, and then a few other things of what you can do. So we'll be handing those out to you. have that information. I just want to thank, obviously, our panel. It's been lovely to be spending the weekend with all of you. Um, I feel so inspired and motivated to keep on doing this work, and to all of you. And you might want to tell everyone if you get their names. That when the movie comes back, hopefully as a theatrical release, we'll need all of you to help. Yeah, so we also, if you have not um, signed the petition, um, feel free to sign the petition. And it's a new one, so those of you who said, I've signed the petition before, um, uh, you know, it's What's a... What's the petition for? It's a, oh, that's a good, good idea. It's a, I stand with Planned Parenthood petition. And so it is saying that you stand with Planned Parenthood, we do give it to your legislators, but we also capture your information so that we can send you periodic updates of how things like the movie or what's going on legislatively in ways that you can get involved. So, with that, thank you. Thank you.